Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, we will go ahead and get started. So welcome to the Black Women in History virtual lecture series. Today we are joined by Dr. Ashley Robertson Preston. Um, and so the Black Women in History virtual lecture series is a series from us at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum, uh, which um, aims to highlight Black women who have made history, right? Pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> Last year, we hosted Dr. Nakadeni, who spoke about Black women's radicalism in the 19th century. Um, a recording of that lecture can be found on our Facebook page. And this year, we're diving into Black women educators uh, who were contemporaries of Dr. Brown's. Uh, today, our guests will take us through the life of Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune, a friend of Dr. Brown's and a great supporter of the Palmer Memorial Institute. Talk to us a little bit about her impact and her work. So Dr. Ashley Robertson Preston is an assistant professor of history at Howard University. Her research interests focus on the activism of Black women during the early 20th century, particularly the work of Mary McLeod Bethune. She's the author of Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, Bringing Social Justice to the Sunshine State, which examines how the educator rose to prominence while fighting for equality at the height of social unrest in the state. Dr. Preston's past positions in the field of public history include serving as director of the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation National Historic Landmark at Bethune-Cookman University. Um, while uh, she was also a technician for the National Archives for Black Women's History at the Mary McLeod Bethune Council House National Historic Site. <laughs> Her most recent book, published just this week, uh, is titled Mary McLeod Bethune, the Pan-Africanist, and you can find it at our gift shop at the Charlotte Hawkins Brown Museum, and I'm sure wherever else books are sold, but buy it from us because we're cool and you can come out and see us. So I will pass it over to Dr. Preston. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, for participants, if you have any questions, drop them in the Q&A and we'll have some time at the end um, to do a little Q&A session. Take it over. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for, for having me, for um, the great work that you all are doing down in North Carolina. Um, I am originally from North Carolina, so I'm always, and I have a lot of family there, so I'm always excited to see um, North Carolina sites um, preserving, still preserving the legacy of uh, those great people who came before us. So thank you for um, this opportunity. Um, so I'm going to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about <laughs> the new book, Mary McLeod Bethune, The Pan-Africanist. And I will also talk a bit about my last book, Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, Bringing Social Justice to the Sunshine State. So I am <clears throat> so proud of the new book and also the last book um, because this is all um, really dedicated to um, raising the profile of Mrs. Bethune, making more people aware of all of the great things that she did on a national and international level. So um, I'm excited to continue to uh, write and produce and uh, do so many things related to her work. So this uh, last book is really, um, a project that I have been working on since about 2010. Um, it started at Howard University where I was a student uh, working on my doctoral degree. I went into the archives and I just began to see all of this um, international travel. It started with, um, I saw that she won the Haitian Medal of Honor and Merit in 1949. And then I saw that she won the Star of Africa in 1952. And so I just began to put together those pieces, um, looking at where she went. Um, and it was just so amazing to me as someone who loves to travel, to see that Mrs. Bethune was traveling around the world as early as 1927 with her first trip to Europe. And so I began to do this research um, it started as a dissertation topic. Um, 
I graduated in 2013, went to work at the Bethune Foundation at Bethune Cookton University. And it was there that I started on Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida. Um, and I'm really glad that I did it because um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the interviews that I did. Um, a couple of those people that I interviewed, those elders have since passed away. So it was um, very um, important for me to capture their voices while they were still alive. I'm gonna screen share. So we're looking at Mrs. Bethune, um, looking at her work in Florida and looking at her work as a Pan-Africanist in these two um, texts. So going back to Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, published in 2015, um, this book was something that I had not set out to do. Um, in my mind, I was gonna go ahead and publish um, Mary McLeod Bethune, the Pan-Africanist, um, but I really began to um, get really involved in Florida, uh, meeting people in the community, speaking at different churches, um, speaking anywhere people would invite me to talk about Mrs. Bethune on the radio station, wherever um, I would go. And so in that experience, I met several people who knew Mrs. Bethune. I thought this was phenomenal. I mean, I've been in DC and you just didn't meet a lot of people who remember her as vividly as the people of Daytona Beach, Florida. And so I met several folks who talked about, you know, driving past her house and seeing her sitting out on the porch or having her to come over for dinner and all of those types of things. And I just felt really strongly about capturing the voices of those local people. And so some of the one of the things that really came across to me um, as a, a scholar studying her life from the perspective of archives is that these were unique voices, just hearing about you know, how she walked, how she talked, it really humanized her. And I wanted to capture that in this um, first text. Um, one of the people that I met who knew her is um, of course her grandson, Mr. Albert McLeod Bethune Jr. He was 96 when he passed away in 2018. He and I became such good friends. I mean, every time he would come to campus, I would call I me, mean, I would go sit with him for hours, talk to him. I would call him up on the phone if I had questions. He would tell me about, you know, what it was like to be her grandson slash legally adopted son. Um, and how he said he didn't really realize her significance until she passed away. And I thought that was really interesting because he said, you know, you have to realize I was young, so my world was not her world. It was, you know, I was doing my own thing. I was living my life as a young man. And when she passed away, you know, I realized, wow, this is a really great woman. She's done so many things. And so he is one of the people that is interviewed in the book. Um, you also have Mr. Harold Lucas, who is, I think he's going to be 92 years old this year. He's still alive. Um, his dad was one of the people who established the business program at Bethune. Um, and he talked about what it was like to be a little boy um, walking around that campus, coming into her home. He says his dad would have meetings with her. and He would just go upstairs and fall asleep. And later on, he became a student at Bethune Cookman. And he talks about walking around the campus with her when she would walk around the campus. Um, he would talk with her and walk with her. And he said she just, she paid a lot of attention to details. Um, he said that she would say, um, look at that piece of trash. Um, Harold, go pick up that trash because maybe someone may pass by here and see that trash and they might not wanna give us a donation. You know, here she is the president or the, the past president at this point, and she's concerned about every aspect of the school. She's concerned about how the classes are being taught. 
she used to walk around the campus. Um, one of the other people that I um, interviewed um, was Dr. Cleo Higgins, who lived to be about 96 or seven, I believe. But she was Mrs. Bethune's protege. And she talks about how um, the year that she came back as president, how she would walk around campus and she would stop in the classrooms, how she would come and give lectures and talk with people about her travels and all of the different things that she had seen while she was out on her trip. And so in one of those interviews, um, and I'm gonna pull it from the book, I have Miss Senorita Locklear. And Miss Locklear was Mrs. Bethune's last secretary. She was the secretary for her um, about the last year and maybe a half of her life. And this is Miss Locklear. She's 90 something years old too, still alive. And one of the things that she talked about, tomorrow, May 18th, is actually the day that Mrs. Bethune passed away, May 18th, 1955. And Ms. Locklear talks about the three requests that Mrs. Bethune made on the last day that she was alive. And so I will read um, just a little excerpt from this. When she came downstairs and after we had read from the upper room, she asked, she said, Senorita, how many chapters has Rackham Holt completed? Rackham Holt was there at the time during the biography. Rackham Holt lived in Ranslow. What she would do was she would come over every day, interview Mrs. Bethune, then she would go back to Ranslow. And some weekends they would spend the weekend at Bethune Volusia Beach because there were no interruptions and they can do so. So between the office and Bethune Volusia Beach, Rackham would interview her. And when she would complete a chapter, she would bring it over for Mrs. Bethune to read. Mrs. Bethune would edit it. After she would edit it, Rackham Holt would go to Ranslow and print it in the final copy. I mean, type it. Because back at that time, you know, in 55, it was typing. And it was done in three copies. And so she talks about the originals and all of those things. Then she says, when I first came on my first day, she was telling me about the office and the procedures. She told me what, it, what was in the safe, and that's one thing. She had a safe in her office, and that's where all of her important documents were kept. So that day, she pointed out three things there. Her will, the chapters, the chapters that Rackham Holt had done, and her business affairs. Those three things, those were the most. She stressed the importance of those, and they were kept under lock in the safe. They were never out at all. So she was telling me the contents of the safe and what was important to her, and those were the three. Now on May 18th, when she came down that morning, after we had our devotion, the question she asked me was, Senorita, how many chapters has Rackham Holt completed on my life? Will you get them for me? And I said, sure, I got them. And she said, will you read them to me? And so she wanted to read those chapters in their entirety. She said she had been listening to them and hearing them one by one, but she wanted to hear her read all of the chapters. So that was one of the requests to um, read the chapters. Um, she also wanted to look over her will that day. That was another one of the requests. And so I will um, have you all to, to read the book to find out that last request. But this is a story that really humanizes Mrs. Bethune. You know, you have this woman, this larger than life figure, and you have someone who is still alive that talks about the concerns that she had on the last day that she was alive, concerned about her legacy, concerned about this book that was being written, wanted to make sure that she was hearing it correctly, that she was able to, you know, have some input and so it's almost as if she knew that something was going to happen that day that she may pass away. So these are some of the things that are included in Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida. And again, one of the focuses within the books, as I talk about in this particular book, as I talk about 
re-examining Mrs. Bethune is humanizing her, letting people know in these oral through these oral interviews, you know, that she had concerns, she had fears, she had things that upset her. And that's something that Mr. Bethune used to always point out to me. He would say, you know, that was my grandmother, but she was a regular person. And I thought that was just an amazing perspective to try to understand. Um, and another part of it, I talk about Bethune Beach, which is a beach that she actually started with some of her very wealthy friends to give African-Americans access to the beach. Her work in Florida, um, also her work with the Bethune Foundation, her home, she opened her home so that people could come visit and learn more about her life. And so those are some of the, the layers that are revealed through Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida. So Mary McLeod Bethune, the Pan-Africanist, I am really excited about um, this book. Um, the cover alone, um, this is a picture of uh, Mrs. Bethune at the Bethune Council House in Washington, DC. She is hosting, NCNW, National Council of Negro Women, is hosting an event um, an intercultural event where they invite foreign students from several universities um, in the Washington DC area. So this home, this, this, this home in DC within itself is a space in which international, like people who are coming from out of the country, particularly people of color, when you think about DC and DC how it is now, you know, we are able to go to hotels, you know, everything is accessible. But at that time, DC was very segregated. So this was a safe space for people of color, for African Americans, um, for people who are coming in from India. I mean, she welcomes them. Um, and this uh, home becomes um, a really significant stopping point for several people, ambassadors, who are coming into the United States, students, these students who are here, who are able to come um, to the school. And so this book, um, I mean, I have been working on this since 2010, even with um, working on the Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, uh, while living in Florida, I met so many people, I was able to work um, at the school and visit the archives and work in the archives. And so in coming back to do, to finish um, this book in 2013, I had more information, more knowledge having worked in two of her homes um, and been in that community with her. And also having discovered um, new archives that I was able to um, utilize in this work, uh, the Amherst Freedom Museum um, up in Canada. I met Miss Elise Harding Davis, who was up in Canada. Um, I was able to find a lot of sources online, newspapers from Bermuda, um, some newspapers from Europe who talked about her visiting in 1927. And so this has really been um, a labor of love uh, completing this book. It has taken a while, but over the years, um, I think that I have been able to really um, learn more, not just through the archives, but through the people that I interacted with and also working in those spaces um, where Mrs. Bethune's legacy was being preserved. So, going back to the, um, the topic, um, how I discovered this topic, in the early years of me doing work on Mrs. Bethune, this was one of the early quotes that I saw, the drums of Africa still beat in my heart. And I said, wow, she's making reference to Africa. Um, and then I saw the um, 
Star of Africa that she was awarded from Liberia in 1952, and then the Haitian Medal of Honor and Merit. Those were the major things that really began to let me know that this was someone who was not just um, uh, an educator, um, civil rights leader who made an impact on the United States, but the world. You know, the fact that she is being recognized in these spaces outside of the United States. And so the drums of Africa, she talks about um, her mother and her mother's side of the family um, being descendants of Africa. And this is one of the quotes from an interview um, that she had with Charles Johnson and I, I think it's it's in the 1940s, this interview, but she is very aware of um, her family's history and legacy. And she is very um, vocal about her connection to Africa. And so in the book, in chapter one, I talk about, and Yes, chapter one, Southern Roots and Evolving African Identity in Bethune's Early Life. I hone in on those early years because I think that too often um, when we're looking at historical figures, we want to talk about the height of their career. We want to talk about, you know, some of those aspects that people kind of already know about, right? And so I spent some time talking about um, South Carolina in particular, um, because I think it left an important mark on her life. Um, again, when we look at people like Malcolm X, for example, um, and the fact that his parents were Garveyites, how does that impact the activism of Malcolm X? When we look at Miss Ida B. Wells and um, the loss of her parents at an early age, how does that impact her? So the early years are very significant and often overlooked. And I spend quite a bit of time looking at um, South Carolina as an important space as it relates to cultural retention, um, looking at the sheer number of Africans who entered the shores of America, North America, through Charleston, South Carolina. That's an important part. Um, looking at the fact that Mrs. Bethune grows up in this state, this state which has such a um, such an important um, African culture that is being retained. Um, when we look at the Gullah people of South Carolina, the Gullah coast, sure she's about 100 miles from the coast, um, being from Maysville, South Carolina, but how the, does that impact her life? Um, how does that impact South Carolinians, Black South Carolinians, that ability to retain culture through the Gullah community? Um, when we look at South Carolina and the sheer number of uh, the enslaved Black community, um, in looking at the 1880 census, the census revealed that South Carolina, followed by Georgia, Louisiana, and Alabama, had the largest number of children born to African parents. And so these stories of um, being a direct descendant of Africans, um, it's, it's, it's significant in South Carolina overall. And so she grows up in the state and oftentimes, you know, we talk about her work in Florida, but South Carolina is an important place for the, as it relates to the story of Mrs. Bethune. And so, she also talks about these earlier years, um, the influence of her mother, who she says um, comes down from one of the great royalties of Africa. Um, 
we see how she believes that her mother has heavily impacted um, her life. So going back to South Carolina, um, actually, let me go back to South Carolina. So in her early years, um, she talks about how she encounters a minister who talks at her church about the need for Africans to go, African-Americans to go to Africa as missionaries. And from that moment on, hearing about being a descendant of Africa um, from her family, this knowledge. And then when she hears that there's an opportunity to go to Africa through the church, um, through this, the minister that comes, you know, she is really excited about this potential opportunity. And so she goes to Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. It is there that she has the idea that she will um, become a missionary and then she's going to go back to Africa. If you look at this um, photo, you see um, Mrs. Bethune is at that point the only African American attending Moody um, Bible Institute, and she does graduate. Um, she goes to Moody again with the idea there is a program that is there in which you can go to Africa as a missionary. And so this is why she selects Moody. Um, the specific reason why she selects Moody because she has the intent on going to Africa. And so again, when we look at the early years, um, you know, this is something that we often kind of skip over but, you know, what would her life, how would her life have been different had she been able to leave Moody and go back to Africa? Um, she says, when I completed my work at Scotia, I was sent to Moody School in Chicago, Illinois. I studied there two years applying myself. I applied to the mission board in New York for a chance to go to Africa. They informed me that no openings were available where they could place Negro missionaries. So they sent me to Augusta, Georgia to work with Lucy Laney. So this is a very um, upsetting thing for her to not be able to follow through with her plan um, to go to Africa. But I, I, I talk a bit in the book about, you know, just the significance of that desire to go. Um, the significance of her um, leaving the South, going to the North with that in mind that I want to go do this. I want to sacrifice my time, do this program because I want to get back to um, my homeland. And the reason I say my homeland is because um, when she goes in 1952, she, she calls this her home. And so... Um, this is uh, a photo of her at Moody. And so actually, let me go back to that and stay there. So again, she ends up becoming an educator. She goes and works with Lucy Craft Laney, an educator in um, Augusta, Georgia, who has started a school there. Um, and it is there that she gets the idea that she will start her own school. And so she's really disappointed that she cannot go to Africa. But as she goes and she works with Lucy Craft Laney and gets the idea of starting her school, she then sees her school as a place where she can serve. Just as she was going to go to another continent and serve, she says, well, maybe my work is supposed to be here, but still keeping Africa in mind. Um, and within her school, especially as the founder, um, she does promote um, the study of um, Africa, the study of Black history, those same things that were imparted into her in terms of um, pride, knowledge of self. Um, she transmits those ideas to her students. And I want to read a quote um, from her. Um, in one of her, uh, the annual meetings for the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History 
uh, the organization started by Dr. Carter G. Woodson, of which she was the president for many years. She says, when they learn the fairy tales of mythical king and queen and princess, we must let them hear too of the pharaohs and African kings and the brilliant pageantry of the Valley of the Nile. When they learn of Caesar and his legions, we must teach them of Hannibal and his Africans. When they learn of Shakespeare, we must teach them of Pushkin and Dumas. When they read of Columbus, we must introduce the Africans who touched the shores of America before Europeans emerged from savagery. So for Bethune, it was important that Black children understood that they did not come from slavery, but that they too were descendants from people who impacted the world in positive ways. Um, teaching about Africa as a place of significance and glory, connect, correcting the narrative of it being a dark continent was a significant part of her work. And so I may not um, be able to reach Africa right now, but even in a space, in a school, in the school that I've started with a dollar and 50 cent, they thank God and five little girls, I can teach my students about Africa. I can teach them about the glorious path of African-Americans. I can encourage them uh, to think on a, uh, a international uh, global level. And so this is um, an important part of her work. And we see um, her becoming involved in the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History, working with Dr. Carter G. Woodson. I mean, she is really, really involved um, in the teaching of Black history um, to, uh, on a national uh, level. And so, of course, she is most known and well known for her work as the founder of National Council of Negro Women, which she started in 1935. Prior to her starting, and this is a, a picture of her um, with some uh, of the NCN, at an NCNW event and in the Bethune um, uh, Council House in DC. So prior to starting the NCNW, um, throughout the book, I talk about the founding of NCNW, but I also talk about her work with National Association of Colored Women started in 1896. And it was there that she was um, the president from 1924 to 1928. And in fact, um, through her work with NACW is actually how um, her and uh, Dr. Charlotte Hawkins Brown actually connected through the NACW. So when you look at NACW, you know, you have all of these leading Black women who are a part of this organization, um, Mrs. Bethune and Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Um, interestingly enough, I didn't know a lot in 2013 when I started at the Bethune home in Daytona. I didn't know a lot about Charlotte Hawkins Brown. But when I came to Daytona and I was talking to um, Mr. Bethune, her grandson, first, Mrs. Bethune had a picture of Charlotte Hawkins Brown, an autographed picture in her house. The other thing I asked Mrs. B Mr. Bethune about it, and he said, oh, that was her best friend. And so as I saw that, I said, wow, I need to know more about her. And I started reading more about uh, Miss Charlotte Hawkins Brown. Um, she came and served as the keynote for Mrs. Bethune at BCC. Um, Mrs. Bethune helped funnel scholarship uh, scholarships into um, Dr. Brown's school during the time that she worked for the National Youth Administration. So the two of them were very close. And in fact, when you look at how they were young women who had started schools, um, young, young women, you know, Mrs. Bethune was about, I think she's 28 years old when she starts her school. Charlotte Hawkins Brown, if I'm not mistaken, she's not even 20 years old when she's initially starting the school. So these are women who had spent and dedicated their entire lives to education. And so then they become 
uh, friends and through the work of National Association of Colored Women and then NCNW, um, they continue this relationship um, as far as uh, working together. Um, and so uh, NCNW and NACW play an important part in Mrs. Bethune's work. But as she is president of NACW, she really encourages them. Um, you know, she meets women who have traveled abroad through her work with NACW. She meets um, a, a lot of folks who are coming in internationally. Um, she becomes really good friends with Margaret Murray Washington. She becomes a mentee of Mary Church Terrells, um, but she challenges NACW and she challenges them to move beyond um, some of the work that they have done in the past in terms of internationalism. Um, I wanted to share this, uh, this quote. Uh, when she becomes president, this is from one of her speeches that she gives. Colored people's difficulties are political and economic throughout the world. Through wise po politics and statements, statementship, they must liberate themselves. Through far-sighted economic leadership, they must master the business of taking care of themselves like other races. Bread born and living here under the American flag, we nevertheless bear a relation to others of our blood. Their problems are our problems and vice versa. All of our wisdom, energy, and foresight should be dedicated to the great task of achieving freedom and independence, which are the highest goals for human striving. We must make this national body of colored women, not merely a national influence, but a significant link between peoples of color throughout the world. A significant link between peoples of color throughout the world. And so this is what she is challenging NACW to do, to become a significant link, to link people of African descent throughout the world, right? But Ultimately, in CNW, the organization she starts in 1935, this is where she is really able to put this into practice. Um, in CNW, one of the things that she does is she invites women to NCNW who have that international experience. Women like Miss Sue Bailey Thurman, the wife of uh, theologian Howard Thurman, who has traveled to India, who has um, been to several other places. And so Sue Bailey Thurman, um, she becomes the editor of the Afro-American Women's Journal. And the Afro-American Women's Journal, when I found it in the archives um, at the National Archives for Black Women's History when I was working there, um, I just thought it was an amazing body of work. Um, you see correspondence from India within this work. Um, you see news stories relating to Afro-Cubans in this journal. Um, you see them really capturing the role of Black women during World War II, placing them in this international uh, conversation within the Afro-American Women's Journal. And so this becomes an important um, new source for the NCNW, but it also becomes an important way for them to highlight the accomplishments of Black women. And they are sharing this with other people. For example, when they go on this trip to Cuba in 1940, they are taking um, copies of the journal with them um, and certain parts of the journal are also written in Spanish. So it is important to them that this journal can go places around the world, that this becomes um, a, a publication that people can look to to find information about what's going on among people of African descent 
not just in the United States, but around the world. And so in 1940, um, the NCNW, under the leadership of Mrs. Bethune, they traveled to Cuba. She does not attend this trip. Um, she was recently hospitalized for several re weeks at Johns Hopkins, spent most of the summer recuperating. But again, she calls on Sue Bailey Thurman and Sue Bailey Thurman um, is able to make sure that this trip happens. The women go to Cuba, um, they meet with a, uh, a Afro-Cuban organization. They are, they are hosted by this organization, um, the, the Women's Cultural Association. And in this, um, in this uh, trip, they have seminars, they learn more about um, Afro-Cuban history. Um, they learn more about just the plight of Afro-Cubans, what is going on in, um, in their communities. They visit some of the homes of the women. Um, and this is um, after Mrs. Bethune travels to Cuba. She goes in 1930. And this is one of the things that her grandson talks to me about um, when I met him. I was like, oh my gosh, I realized that you were on the, Q the, the trip to Cuba. And he was, he was a young boy. Um, I think he was about eight or nine. And he says, well, the only thing I can remember was waiting out in the hot sun. And so what happened was when she went to Cuba in 1930, and it made the Black newspapers, I mean, it was, it was everywhere. Um, she was actually not allowed to enter initially. Um, all of the other people who were with her, who were much lighter skinned, were able to go ahead and go past. And because she was darker, she was held there um, and she had to wait until um, some of the people whom, of whom she was visiting had to come get her um, from where she was waiting. So her grandson was 90 something years old. He remembered waiting in that hot sun. And that is what the uh, newspaper talked about, how she had to wait. Um, and still, she was not deterred from connecting with Afro-Cubans. I think that's really significant. You know, even though she had this experience in 1940, NCNW still travels to Cuba and makes it a point to learn more about the plight of Afro-Cubans almost a decade later. Um, and also, she was inducted into um, an uh, Afro-Cuban Society of Letters, um, a, a, an organization that was there. And so she continues this relationship um, with Afro-Cubans over the years. And this is just one of these um, ways in which NCNW is seeking to internationalize their organization through this type of travel in which they go and they learn and they, you know, meet people and they talk and they discuss you know, how they're feeling, what's going on, what they can do. Um, and so Mrs. Bethune is very much involved in this. Um, for example, when she goes to Haiti in 1949, when she comes back, she challenges the NCNW to help her to raise money for a orphanage in Haiti. And so these trips are not just um, to go and be on vacation um, and to go see the blue you know, the blue water. These are trips in which you are to learn, in which you are to find out, you know, what can be done as an organization, as an individual even, once you come back to the United States. Again, that significant link that she is calling for um, during her tenure with the NACW, you know, she does, she implements this with NCMW through these travels, through this journal. And so this is the... Um, trip to, to uh, Cuba. And so um, in 1954, uh, Mrs. Bethune travels to Canada, to uh, Ont Ontario, Ontario. I'm sorry, no, to, yes, to Ontario. And while she is there, um, she speaks at the Emancipation Day celebration. And this was a very large Emancipation Day celebration. Um, when I did the book, um, when I finished um, in recently, when I was going back to it and trying to figure out what needed to be included, 
This is actually something that in the original manuscript, I did not include. I saw she went to Canada, but I wasn't really sure what she was doing there um, because the first trip that she took in 1945, there was very little information. Um, but this 1954 trip, she is going to speak at this Emancipation Day celebration. And she also is being hosted by the Hour a Day Study Club. And this was re really interesting to me because I was able to find the Hour a Day um, Study Club on Facebook. I connected with them on Facebook and I ended up speaking with some of the members. Um, I spoke with Ms. Harding. And they told me about her trip in 1954. Ms. Harding was actually a child and remembered it. And they talk about how um, even in Canada, she shows up to her hotel and she is told that she cannot check into her hotel. And so she's there with First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who is also speaking. And the two of them end up leaving the hotel, but it made the newspapers, you know, you have this woman by 1954, you know, this is just a year before her passing. She's known throughout the world. She's traveled to Liberia. She's been in Haiti. She's worked with President Roosevelt and still she's facing discrimination in Canada. And so the next day when she gives her speech at this Emancipation Day celebration, you know, she talks about how you know, there's all of these great things. We've made all this progress, but there's still work to be done as it relates to equality. Like there's, we cannot stop here. This Emancipation Day celebration, yes, we are celebrating, but we're also still working. Um, we're also still a part of this struggle. And so it's really interesting that she has to channel what has happened to her just the night before as she is speaking at this Emancipation Day celebration. And so her work, um, her visit to Canada, um, she's hosted by the Hour Day Study Club. They host a high tea for her. And while she's at this tea, she speaks to the women about her experience as an educator, as someone who started with very humble beginnings. Um, and she just shares her wisdom. And so in these last few years of life, she does a lot of traveling in this uh, chapter. I think it's chapter five. I talk about, <clears throat> actually, I think it's chapter six, but I talk about the traveling and how she becomes a mentor to many women that she meets abroad um, who request that she comes even after she retires from the National Council of Negro Women in 1949. The work continues, but it's very different. She's more in a mentorship capacity now. She is speaking and sharing her wisdom as far as organizing. She's sharing her wisdom as far as how she has been a leader, how she has rose up the ranks, how she has stood against um, racism and discrimination. So she is spending those last few years really imparting her legacy into some of these future leaders and these younger people. Um, so, she retires, but she, she's traveling extensively in these last few years. And one of those, um, one of those trips is um, to Liberia in 1952. And I wanna read a, a short quote from um, So this is a quote um, in which she writes in the uh, Chicago Defender. And so a, another one of the major sources that I used was her writings in the Chicago Defender. She was a columnist for the Chicago Defender. Um, she wrote for several years. She also wrote for the Pittsburgh Courier for several years. So these are such important documents in which we kind of see more about her thoughts um, on what's going on nationally and internationally. And she also shares some on her travels. Um, she shares, you know, it's really a lot of different topics. She talks about aging. She talks about being thankful for a new year. I mean, it's a really <clears throat> interesting um, body of work just to see her writings. And Miss Locklear, her last secretary said that 
that was one of the things that she actually had encouraged Mrs. Bethune to do was to maybe compile those writings and to put them into a book, um, but that did not happen. So of her uh, 1952 trip, she says, I was thrilled to set foot in this soil of Africa, which I have so long dreamed of visiting, of returning to my homeland. And so again, as I started, I talked about, you know, the significance of Africa um, within her story, like how she felt connected as someone who was a descendant of Africans and how finally, you know, at the age of 20, she's trying to go to Africa as a missionary, but it's not until the end of her life, she's about 76, that she finally goes and she says, you know, I was, I, I was home, like this was home for me. And upon her return, again, talking about her um, Chicago Defender columns, she encourages other African-Americans to also visit Africa to see what, you know, what they can do to aid Africans, to think about, you know, um, whether or not they may want to move there. I mean, she is really just excited and re-energized in terms of um, this visit and what it does for her. Um, and I think it it is the fulfillment of a lifelong goal. So the <clears throat> so the um, the books again um, talk about her work in Florida, um, her work internationally, and I hope that especially with this last book, Mary McLeod Bethune, the Pan Africanist, is that she will be recognized as someone who is not just an educator, you know, not just a woman who has worked with women's organizations, but someone who is very involved in the conversation internationally that is happening in terms of how to connect people of African descent. Um, and she's concerned about issues that are impacting people of African descent um, throughout the world. And so um, I will now go into the questions. I hope that, um, uh, you all have been uh, enlightened by some of the things that I've shared, um, and I hope that you all enjoyed the book. I look forward to the feedback on Amazon and all of these various places um, where you all will share feedback about the book. Awesome. Thank you so much. So we do have a couple of questions, and I will uh, save my own selfish questions until the end. Um, but, um, well, first is just a very practical one. The council house um, in DC, uh, that is no longer a residence, right? Can you tell us a little bit about that National Historic Site and, and what that means and what you can do there today? Yeah, it's, it's not a, a um, it, you can't stay there anymore, but during segregation, during the time that, you know, Mrs. Bethune was the president of NCNW, people could rent rooms there. People could come um, to meet her, to meet NCNW. Um, they hosted events. Now it is a part of the National Park Service. Um, you can visit the home. I think that it's going to be open every day of the week soon, but I think for now, they have certain days that they're open. Um, when you are there, please see Ranger John Fowler, uh, one of my dear friends um, who is very knowledgeable on Mrs. Bethune, particularly on her tenure in Washington, D.C. and all of the great things that she did there. So they do have um, events. In fact, they celebrate her birthday every year um, in July. They do a big birthday celebration in which they take a bus tour around the city. They highlight, excuse me, different historical um, sites related to Mrs. Bethune, like her statue in, um, that is in Lincoln Park. And so I would encourage everyone as we talk about visiting DC, of course now, you know, we give a lot of attention to NAMAC, the National Museum of African-American History and Culture, which is an excellent like phenomenal site, right? But please see the Bethune home. 
um, in DC. And also please see the Frederick Douglass home in DC. Great sites. I mean, and these are people that we hear about, but I'm telling you to walk into those homes, to see where they live, to see where they slept. I mean, it's just a great experience. And, and I know you all understand the significance of these historic homes um, doing the work that you all do. Absolutely. Um, can you talk a little bit more about um, uh, Mrs. Bethune's leaving? The question here is, why did Mrs. Bethune leave the NACW and form the NCNW? So if you know anything about Mrs. Bethune, um, when we look at her starting the school, right, she had worked with Lucy Craft Laney. She even worked with another school out of Palaka. But it was her desire to start her own school. You know, she was a founder. She was someone who wanted, you know, she really wanted NACW to go further with some of their work. Um, she wanted them to go further with the international work. You know, they invited people to speak. Um, they invited, you know, they invi invited people who were members to talk about some of their travels. But she was really, really set on having NCNW, and NCNW to travel and to go to those places. We see them going to Cuba. Um, we see them traveling. I mean, she wanted to take it up a notch in terms of international engagement. And that was one of the reasons why she started NCNW. And, and I mean, honestly, the type of leader that she was, she wanted her own organization. I say that NACW and her work with the International Council of Women of Darker Races, these were like training grounds for her. You know, even her work with Lucy Craft Laney, she says, I studied Miss Lucy Craft Laney. I saw the great things that she was doing, but the type of person that she was, she wanted her own. I mean, she was just a leader who had so much to give um, and she wanted to, to create her own organization. And lastly, um, when we look at NACW, right, and her um, uh, setting up their um, headquarters, the organization had been around since 1896, but it was not until Mrs. Bethune came that she raised money for them to actually have the headquarters. And it was a lot of money. You know, so she was a visionary. And so when NCNW got started, you know, that was something that was at the top of the agenda. Like, we're not going to wait um, almost 30 years to have the headquarters. So I, I really think she thought she could do this a bit better. And she also wanted to work more with the government. And that is something that NCNW did a lot of, um, particularly during the time that she worked for the National Youth Administration. So she had to do that, you know, with her own organization. So I'm, I'm gonna kind of combine two questions now. Um, so uh, the relationship between Dr. Brown and Mrs. Bethune, you mentioned uh, that they were very close friends um, and uh, Mrs. Bethune in her work with the um, youth administration providing scholarships to Palmer was like really instrumental in keeping Palmer um, around. And, and I can say Mrs. Bethune personally donated and fundraised money for Palmer during uh, the Great Depression when Palmer was really in a tight spot financially. So um, like not enough can be said about the relationship between, between the two women personally and professionally. Um, but there was a moment in the in the 40s and the 50s where they were had a bit of a public falling out. And so this ties into the question of um, was Mrs. Bethune ever accused of being a communist sympathizer? Um, and in my research, what I have seen is that this was kind of the root of the little disagreement between the two women is that Dr. Brown was um, and, and yeah, do, can you speak to that kind of era a little bit and the kind of negotiations that had to be made with her as a public figure and having so many things um, and the relationship between the two women? Yeah, that was uh, when I came to the uh, National Archives for Black Women's History, which was at the time the archive 
was behind the house, um, the DC Bethune home. That was one of the first um, documents that I saw. It was talking about Mrs. Bethune um, speaking at a school. She's supposed to speak at a school in New Jersey and she's turned around because they're like, she's a communist. And, you know, she had to have a lot of different people come to her defense. I mean, she worked really hard to clear her name. She's calling on First Lady Roosevelt. I mean, she's calling on all of these different people to try to clear her name. And to be quite honest with you, in terms of African-American leadership, I mean, at that time, it was really hard to, to, to navigate that waters. I mean, like a lot of people were being pulled into this, this communism issue. So yes, she did face that. But I'm interested to hear your story about Miss um, Brown because I didn't. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah, the two of them. So um, Dr. Brown spoke about uh, the role of democracy and race and democracy. And she kind of got in some hot water um, because she gave a speech um, about race in the USSR and how the Soviets uh, had this idea of race and gender a little bit better than the United States did. Um, and so that combined with the work that she was doing at the time got her labeled uh, a communist. And she, at the time with the NCNW, um, I believe this was around the time or maybe around one of the moments where she was looking to be in more of a leadership position within the organization and wanting to um, push the organization in her own ways. And uh, Mrs. Bethune publicly told her, like, you have to denounce this communism stuff or like we cannot be affiliated with you. And wow. Dr. Brown uh, would not renounce the work that got her labeled a communist. And so the two very and it was like in newspapers as like a gossip issue of like mm -hmm. oh the, they're not friends anymore which you know it's obviously going to be much more complicated than that but uh yeah yeah so the communism issue was very real <laughs> yeah and and i i talked about this last night at the book launch um you know we tend to romanticize history right we we say like oh those people work together this and that but they had their spats, they had their differences. You know, I've seen the letters between Mrs. Bethune and, 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 and Dr. Brown and, you know, all of her friends, you know, they get upset with one another. They, you know, it's, it's normal. It's, it's very normal, these fallouts. But at the end of the day, what I think they always held at the forefront was the importance of lifting the race. Um, and that was what kept them pushing forward and pushing past these um, these issues. And so um, ultimately, you know, they were really good friends. And for Mrs. Mr. Bethune to say that to me, like, he's like, oh, that's her best friend. And I'm like, oh my gosh, wow. Um, Mrs. Bethune, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs, the three B's of education, like these women are very close in age. They have taken on this mighty task of starting these schools um, at a really young age and like spent most of their lives dedicated to education, but not just education, like all issues that are impacting people of African descent, like voting, I mean, women's rights issues. It's just amazing to see what they did and also what they were able to accomplish with so little. Like I'm always inspired by that. Absolutely. Um, uh, one more question from the Q&A here. And I will say, if anybody else has questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A. If you're watching on Facebook, feel free to drop your question in the chat. Um, what do you think Mrs. Bethune would have to say about Bethune-Cookman University today? And I'll throw in there the landscape of Black education and the state of HBCUs. Yeah, I, I think Mrs. Bethune still roams that campus. I, I honestly do. When I was there, I was just like, just, I, I'm telling you, like, we all felt her presence. And it's such a 
a beautiful campus, a beautiful campus. But I think that overall in looking at HBCUs today, I think she would be really proud of HBCUs and especially the attention that HBCUs are getting, the positive attention that HBCUs are getting, um, the great donations that HBCUs are getting, like, you know, the, the, the media attention that we're getting in terms of different people who have graduated from our schools. You know, I saw Oprah going back to her alma mater the other day and it like was just a big splash in the news that she was there. Like that's something to be proud of because there's so many people who got their starts at HBCUs. There are so many important movements that have come through HBCUs, the civil rights movement. When we look at Alabama State, I was watching Alabama State the other day um, on, a, on a reality show, but in that reality show, they were talking about the significance of Alabama State, how, you know, Mrs. Parks attended one of the training schools at Alabama State and how the, the people who started the movement, like Ms. Joanne Robinson, a professor at Alabama State. And so I just think that she would be encouraged by the fact that people are really showing HBCUs love. Not that we haven't loved them all of this time, but it's just beautiful to see more people than the people who attend them um, showing HBCUs love. Yeah, and I will um, shout out um, Dr. Jelani Favors from North Carolina a and um, uh, His recent book, I think it's called Shelter in the Storm, is all about kind of paying homage and, and highlighting the way that HBCUs historically have been these training grounds and these launching um pads for uh, leaders and activists and um, have played such a pivotal and important role in the civil rights movement and in different movements um, for marginalized people and Black people in particular. So um, yes, that's awesome. So um, I have a question for you. Um, you mentioned the amount of work that uh, Mrs. Bethune did and writing in uh, writing on a weekly basis, you know, giving her speeches, all of her papers from her organization, from founding the school, all of those things, um, she preserved all of that, right? She understood the importance of having an archive. Um, mm -hmm. When you're going through that, like, how do you make the decisions on this is what I'm going to write about and this is what I'm going to talk about? And what are kind of some of the things that you've had to leave behind that you're like, I want to pick at that again later um, or just wish you had more time for? Yeah, so the chapter in the new book um, on NCNW and the legacy of NCNW after Mrs. Bethune passes away that chapter is much shorter than it was originally. I had all of this information about NCNW, all these conferences that, it, that they attended internationally, um, all of this travel that Dr. Height did um, to Africa and all these various places, but I had to shorten it because I really wanted the focus to be on Mrs. Bethune and the next few years um, after she passed away. I didn't want to take the focus into the work of NCNW prior to her passing. Um, so that was really hard because I had pages and pages and pages of, that were there before that I decided to just kind of cut. Um, um, what else? How do you decide? So I'm actually working on, uh, I've, I've done a proposal for another project that I would like to do <laughs> and looking at her work, um, with the Roosevelt administration, because I think that we talk a lot about it and she's recognized for it, but um, I want to give some serious attention to, you know, how she really helped shift the African American community in terms of voting for the um, Democratic Party. So that is something that I'm, I'm working on. I've been kind of looking at it. But, you know, there are so many books. Last night, someone was asking me about, you know, some of the women that she worked with, like Sue Bailey Thurman. And I said, the women who were mentored by Mrs. Bethune, that's a book within itself. 
you know, all of these people, if you look at women who lived during that time, um, I was on a panel with um, Ashley Farmer and Dr. Ashley Farmer out of, um, she's in Texas and she was talking about um, Queen Mother Audley Moore. And that is someone who, you know, she met Mrs. Bethune when she was really young and she had her to speak in front of NCNW and she talks about being really nervous, you know? So she just encountered so many people and impacted so many people, you know, that it's just, it's a lot. Like I still struggle with, you know, what book project to do next or what digital project to do next. And I've tried to get away from it before and now I'm just embracing it. I'm like, you know what? Let me go ahead and 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 kind of think about what to do next. And so I've been kind of toying with the idea of a digital project too, um, because I want to make sure that people even outside of academia know more about her work. Yeah, I was going to ask, will you ever get away from her? But <laughs> there's so think so. I think I'm 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 stuck. I'm yeah. Stuck. I'm <laughs> yeah. There's so fun. much, and it's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. What are the best resources for folks who want to do more research on Mrs. Bethune? If folks want to engage with her papers themselves or do that primary source digging themselves, where should they go? So you have the National Archives for Black Women's History. Um, this is the one of the only repositories dedicated solely to the preservation of Black women's history. Um, they have a lot of her papers related to her work with NCMW. Um, of course, the Bethune Foundation papers. Um, I believe Daytona, Daytona Beach, Bethune Cookman has those papers, but there's also papers on microfilm. So um, those are accessible. Um, at, I believe the Library of Congress has those. So, um, and honestly, there are so many different archives that like people who I've encountered that have stuff on Mrs. Bethune in their archives, like Moreland, Spingarn has letters from Mrs. Bethune to various people in their archives. And so even in some of these archives, there may not be a collection dedicated to Mrs. Bethune, but she's there, especially if you're looking at people who are, you know, alive around the time that she's alive. Do you all have some papers on Mrs. Bethune? Y'all have an archive there, right? We have a, a small teaching collection, yeah, that we have acquired, but most of Dr. Brown's papers are actually at Radcliffe. Um, oh. Yeah, but there, yes, there are letters and there are papers there that relate to Mrs. Bethune, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Um, so if there are, we have um, a note here from Margie McLean, the first vice president of the North Carolina Coalition of the National Council of Negro Women, and she has worked with us. So um, say hi to Margie. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Yeah. Um, voice recordings. This has been something that has kind of like plagued us here at the museum <laughs> that for a woman who spoke so much in so many different places through so many different decades, we have not been able to get our hands on any voice recording of Dr. Brown's, but do you have, or do you know of voice recordings of Mrs. Bethune? Yeah, the Bethune Council House actually has um, one of her uh, last public speeches that she gave um, and let me see if I can actually find that speech. Um, give me a second. It's, it's, it's online. Yeah, it's, it's online for the National Park Service. If I play this, can you hear it? Let's see. May I thank you, my friends, Madam Chairman, platform guests, Ladies and gentlemen, my beloved daughters, this is a very moving moment for me. This is not the time for me to speak. This is the time for me to sit 
in great humility, with my head bowed, my soul looking upward, with a gratitude to a God who has made it possible for one like me to stand before an audience like this, who come to pay homage. So I won't play the whole thing, but this is the, the link. Um, it's a speech from 1955, a couple of months before she passed away. Um, she's talking to the women of National Council of Negro Women. So um, I hope that you all take a look at that and uh, take a listen to that. And um, again, this is on the Bethune Council House site. So you can kind of see some stuff about the site too. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's like a full body chills moment. And I did put that in the comments of the video on the Facebook as well. So folks can go back and reference that. Um, that's amazing. So um, to kind of wrap us up here, um, if, for folks who are interested in continuing to learn about Mrs. Bethune's life and, and the kind of global context of um, work across the African diaspora, what are some sources that you found either books or if there are any like podcasts or shows or films that you recommend people read or watch? Um, yeah, what 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 are those? <laughs> Besides so, your books, of course. <laughs> so when it comes to the international impact, honestly, um, this is really the first book that brings all of that together. Um, when I was looking for more information on the international work in terms of books or articles, <laughs> when I first started on this topic in 2010, um, there I, I couldn't really find anything. I saw like her traveling, but it was everything was really in the archive. Um, and there have been some people who have made reference to it. Um, there's a book with uh, uh, Dr. Keisha Blaine and Dr. Uh, Tiffany Gill, who do um, have an article about her work at the United Nations. Um, and also there's Dr. Ida, um, Ida Jones' book, uh, Mary McLeod Bethune in DC. She talks about the home being a space where, you know, international people would gather. And so that's another um, book that references her work. Um, but this is the first that you know, kind of delves into that work in its entirety. So the archives are those two books. <laughs> Someone can write another book. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. Well, Dr. Preston, thank you so much for spending time with us on this I had to check the calendar Wednesday evening. <laughs> I know this is a very busy time with you with the book. And so I really, really appreciate it. And I hope that folks have um, enjoyed this and come back and see us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks everyone to everyone for joining um, near, far, wherever you are. I appreciate you. And I hope that you guys will go out and get the book. Hope that you will visit these historic sites. Um, hope that you'll visit the Charlotte Hawkins Brown site, Mrs. Bethune's home, um, Douglas's home. Like, please support our historic sites. I mean, especially when we look at um, people who are trying to remove history from classrooms. You know, these sites are going to be more important than ever. And I would just challenge you all and, and encourage you to support and visit these places. Thank you guys so much. Have a great night, everybody.